Greetings. Um, my name is Ava Perkis. I'm an historian and a faculty member in the Departments of American Culture and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Michigan. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of gynecology as a profession. And the title of this very short lecture is uh, The Raison d'etre of Obstetrics and Gynecology race and true patienthood. And I'll start with a short anecdote about a late 19th century gynecologist. So in 1897, Dr. James Reed Chadwick, a founding member and then president of the American Gynecological Society, delivered an impassioned speech about reproductive organ removal to his colleagues. In admonishing fellow gynecological surgeons about their eagerness to perform hysterectomy and oophorectomy, he stated, quote, so we find ourselves at the end of the 19th century with less reason to dread the opening of the abdominal cavity than our immediate predecessors had to dread even minor operations upon the body and limbs. But I would beg you to pause a moment and consider with me if this operational theory has not gone too far. No one can deny that for the race, it is an unmixed evil to have a large percentage of our women still in the childbearing age rendered suddenly sterile beyond recall, end quote. So what did Chadwick mean by our women? And what did he mean by the race? Who did Chadwick imagine as the patients receiving these surgeries and why did he consider them so evil? Throughout his speech, Chadwick used implicit racial language to advocate for more minimally invasive gynecological surgery for his white female patients. He offered alternatives to more radical, oft practiced surgical, surgical protocols like partial removal of the ovaries or evacuating serum or pus from an occluded fallopian tube without sacrificing it. And those are his words and his suggestions. As the field of gynecology professionalized in the late 19th century and entered a new respected medical era in the 20th century, white male doctors established new treatment modalities, sanitation standards, guidelines on bedside manner, and guiding principles for gynecology with white middle-class women in mind. White women were the specialty's true, treasured, and rightful patients. As historian Laura Briggs notes, white women became the raison d'etre or reason for being of obstetrics and gynecology. Chadwick's anxiety about white women's fertility is one of many historical examples of stratified reproduction in which white medical professionals placed a higher value on the fertility of some women, namely white middle-class women over others. From the perspective of Chadwick and his contemporaries, the field of gynecology and obstetrics was created for the benefit of white women and their offspring. The specialty, in fact, was partly responsible for helping to reduce what some eugenicists at the time considered race suicide or fears of a declining white population vis-a-vis -vis a seemingly booming black and brown population at the turn of the 20th century. While coercive sterilizations are often cited as the most pernicious example of stratified reproduction, the outlook of physicians like Dr. Chadwick were and are important to sustaining racial health disparities in obstetrics and gynecology. So by contrast, Black women were not regarded as full and true and deserving patients by the mostly white gynecological profession. Even after the experimentations on enslaved women by J. Marion Sims in the 1840s, who is considered the father of modern gynecology, white physicians continue to disregard the pain, suffering, and needs of their Black female patients. Several leading white obstetricians of the late 19th century, 
like Joseph Tabor Johnson and George Julius Engelman um, argued without evidence or careful study that fertility was high and childbirth was easy for Black women, whereas white women struggled to conceive and to carry to term. Aspiring physicians learned from textbooks like Edward P. Davis's A Treatise on Obstetrics, published in 1897, J.M. Baldy's An American Textbook of Gynecology, published in 1898, and Howard Atwood Kelly's Medical Gynecology, published in 1912, which displayed all of these texts, uh, displayed the faces and naked bodies of Black women as anatomical models, while white female models' faces were concealed and their identities were protected. In the early 20th century, white physicians, including gynecologists, often regarded Black people as non-critical patients that they could use to build up their nascent practices. White doctors often delivered, as historian Thomas Ward notes, second-class service while charging first-class rates, to their ailing African-American patients. For the burgeoning field of obstetrics and gynecology, Black women seem to reside outside of the bounds of true and rightful patienthood. When women of color and white providers enter the clinical encounter, they bring these histories with them. As Lisa Harris and Taita Wolf explain, quote, today's family planning practitioners work not just in the shadow of an isolated past episode in US medicine, but in a broader context of much larger set of attitudes. And those attitudes are grounded in a history of stratified reproduction and racism in medicine. Today, when white women patients interact with the field of obstetrics and gynecology, they engage a medical specialty that was created specifically for their health, welfare, and successful reproduction. Although sexism, classism, homophobia, and ableism can and does impede the care that white women receive, they remain racial beneficiaries of a specialty that was created for their benefit and has perceived them as valuable. Patients of color do not enter the clinical space with this historical advantage and are rightfully suspicious. Past and current reproductive injustices render their medical mistrust valid and rational. Racial disparities in obstetrics and gynecology will persist if women of color, especially Black women, are not regarded as true and rightful patients. White women, their fertility, their wombs, pregnancy, and offspring cannot continue to function as the profession's reason for being. It might benefit us to ask, as medical learners and providers, what would it mean to imagine Black women and other marginalized people as true, valuable, and worthwhile patients, as has been the case for white women? What would it mean for the field of obstetrics and gynecology to generate a politics of care and create a new reason for being around reconciling and repairing historical reproductive injustices? Thank you.